Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for our Bible study tonight. We thank you for the things you did for us during the retreat. Thank you because of your grace in our lives. And thank you for the love and the interest to study your word that makes us gather together today here again. We pray, O Lord, that you teach us by your spirit in Jesus' name. And we pray that your plan and purpose for a study like this will be fulfilled in every one of our hearts and lives in Jesus' name. Open our eyes of understanding, write these words upon the tables of our hearts, make us strong by the study of your word in Jesus' name. We pray that every doubt will flee away. Assurance and confidence, hope, faith in you will be born as we study your word in Jesus' name. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. We thank the Lord for bringing us together for our Bible study today. And I'm so happy that uh, you could be here after the retreat that just finished yesterday. I pray the Lord will renew your strength in Jesus' name. Of course, you can tell your prayers for me is being answered. I'm going stronger and stronger in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Some people suggest I should not have Bible study now because of the retreat. I should be sleeping somewhere. But thank God we're here. I said thank God we're here. We're now in Hebrews chapter 13. We are going now from verse 14 all through to verse 16. Hebrews 13, verse 14 to verse 16. For here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. By him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is, the fruit of our leaves giving thanks to his name. But to do good... And to communicate, forget not. For with such sacrifices, the Lord our God is well pleased. Today, as we look at the subject, we're talking about believers' desire for the heavenly city. You will see that the text begins with a little word. That little word is for. And that word for actually means because. If I read that again, it means because here... We have no continuing city, but we stick one to come. And you know that whenever you start a sentence and you say, because, it means something preceded what you are saying. Therefore, you'll go back and look at what preceded what you are just saying now. That is in verse 13. Let us go forth, therefore, unto him, without the camp bearing his reproach. And the question is, why are we going forward? Why are we going forth? Why are we leaving the city in which we are? Why are we leaving it behind? And why are we moving on to another place? It says, because we have not here a continuing city, and we're seeking one yet to come. That's the connection between verse 13 and, in ver and verse 14. It's like uh, the song we sing, Abide With Me. One of the lines there says, Change and decay in all around I see. That is, there is nothing permanent here. There is nothing lasting here. There is nothing durable or stable in this world. Because of that, it says, we seek another country. We seek another city. There is no continuing one here. In various parts of the New Testament, we're told about the condition of the present world. We're told in 1 Corinthians 7, 31, that the fashion of this world passes away. And then in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 11, it tells us, all these things, the things we see now, the things that look beautiful now, the things that are that taking the attention of many people now, all these things shall be dissolved. And in First John chapter 2 verse 17, the world passes away and the lost thereof. It is because of this we are not to put our heart on the things of this world. We are not to rest here below because there is no continuing city here. The properties of the world, the material things of the world, 
world, the money, the prosperity. We cannot put our heart on anything. We're moving on. We go forth out of this city and we're going to the heavenly place. There is nothing durable. There is nothing stable. There is nothing lasting in here. But the thing that is lasting, everlasting, is in front of us. That's what we're seeking in Proverbs chapter 23. Proverbs chapter 23 and in verse 5. It tells us, Will thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings, and they fly away as an eagle towards heaven. You see that? It's saying that you cannot rest here below. You cannot put your mind, you cannot put your thoughts, you cannot fix your heart on things here below, even the riches, even the wealth, even the possession. Even the property, because riches, wealth, certainly will make themselves wings and fly away. In fact, Micah tells us, Micah chapter 2, in Micah chapter 2, he tells us that our rest is not here. Our confidence is not here. We're seeking another place. Micah chapter 2 and in verse 10, arise ye and depart, for this is not your rest. Because it is polluted. It shall destroy you. Even with its sore destruction. That's the condition of the world in which we are living in. The Christian cannot put his heart in this world. It is not stable. It is not durable. Therefore it says, Arise ye and depart. For this is not your rest. We are going to a place of rest. We are going to a place where the rest The joy, the happiness, the blessing will not be interrupted and will not be disturbed because this world is polluted already. That's the reason why we're seeking for things above. We do not settle on things here on earth. We come back to Hebrews chapter 13. As we look at these verses, we're going to divide into three parts. Number one, seeking the eternal city of God. Seeking... The eternal city of God. Number two, the sacrifice of praise to God. The sacrifice of praise to God. Number three, the service that pleases God. The service that pleases God. Number one, seeking the eternal city of God. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 14, it says, For here, at this time, in this era, this dispensation and age, and here, while we are here looking at things that are seen, we have no continuing city, and we seek, but we seek one yet to come. Archaeologists will tell us that some big, beautiful, great, mighty cities of the past, they are destroyed already, and we do not have any place for them anymore. As you think about cities like Nineveh, and you think of cities like Tyre and Sidon, and you think of cities like Babylon, cities that had great name and great peculiarities in those days, and that the historians talk of the wonders of the ancient world. Where are they today? They are no more to be found. What has happened to all those cities will happen to the cities of today. That's why the inspired writer is saying, here on earth we have no continuing city. It is there today it is forgotten tomorrow. It is there today. It is covered with the debris of its destruction tomorrow. And yet there is a permanent one. There is an eternal one. That's the one we're seeking. We seek the one to come. In uh, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 9. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 9. It tells us that our rest is not now. We're seeking for another one. Chapter 4 verse 9. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. That rest will be in heaven. Already I've told you and the Bible confirms it that everything in this world is short is short lived. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and in verse 29. But this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remains that both they that have wives be as though they had none, and they that weep be as though they wept not, and they that rejoice be as though they rejoice not, and they that buy as though they possess not, and they that use this world as not abusing it for the fashion of this world 
passeth away. Everything in the world, the things that are good and the things that are bad, the pleasure and the pain, they will not last. They are passing away. That's why we cannot put our mind on the things that are passing away. We cannot put our mind, whether it is pleasure or something good, we know that even if it is good, it's not something permanent. That's why we read it in Proverbs chapter 23, verse 5, the riches, the wealth. The material things, they are passing away. Therefore, we cannot set our hearts on them. But the good part of it also is that the pain, the persecution, the suffering, the problem that a person may have on earth, all that is passing away to you. It's not a permanent thing. Therefore, we will not allow the passing pain, the temporary pain, the temporary suffering to hinder us and hinder us from getting to that place where we are going. Because what happens in this world, Everything will soon come to an end in First Peter chapter four. First Peter chapter four and in verse seven. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. The end of all things is at hand. Because the things we see will soon vanish away. That's why we do not fix our hearts. We do not fix our attention on the things of the world. Rather, we fix our eyes on God. We fix our eyes on things above. We're seeking the kingdom of God and His righteousness. We're seeking the inheritance. That is, re- that is reserved in heaven for us. You see, the patriarchs of old, the people of old, the children of God in olden days, that's the way they lived their lives. They did not put their attention on the passing things of the world. They were seeking the things yet to come, especially the heavenly city. In Hebrews chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11, reading from verse 9, by faith. He, Abraham, sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs of him, with him, of the same promise. For he looked for a city which has foundation, whose builder and maker is God. How we see that Abraham could live a contented life, A happy life, a life that was so satisfied, even when Lord chose the good part of the land and he was contented with what he had, oh, because his mind was not there, he knew it was a temporary thing and he knew that the permanent blessing was really up there in heaven. And verse 10 tells us the secret he looked for a city which has foundation, whose builder and maker is God. Since man lost the Garden of Eden, the first paradise. It had been in the heart of God that he will take us to another place, a beautiful place where there will be no problem, where there will be no tears, where there will be no sickness, where there will be no suffering, where there will be no temptation, where there will be no demon or devils. And so he has gone to prepare, the Lord Jesus has gone to prepare that place for us. And we, who are the children of Abraham by faith, the same thing he did is what we should be doing now. Whatever we have on earth, whatever we enjoy on earth, or whatever we do have on earth, or we say that doesn't really matter. Because in any case, all these things are temporary. We're looking for a city like Abraham, which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. In verse 14, for they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. They are living in a country here, and whenever there are disappointments, and whenever there are problems, oh, they say, well, this home in any case is not our home. We're going to a better place. All those who speak like that, they plainly declare, and they clearly say that they are seeking for a country. And truly, in verse 15, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they they might have had opportunity to have returned. You see, if their minds were in the world, take Abraham for example, he came out of the awe of the Chaldees because the Lord called him. And then when he had difficulty, if his mind had been in the place he led, if he didn't know, it was a temporary thing. We do not have here a continuing city. If he didn't know that, he would have returned. But he was looking forward all the time. The same thing with us. We know the Lord has called us out of the world. 
world. We have burnt the bridge behind us. There is nothing in the world we are going for again. We are moving forward. We are looking forward. We are looking up. And when our Lord shall come, he will take us unto himself. The people that are looking back, the people that are thinking, maybe there is still something good there in the world that I am missing. They are the people that backslide. That's why it says in verse 15, truly, if they had had, if they had been mindful of that country, from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now, they desire a better country. That is, and heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Praise the Lord. He has prepared for us a city. We shall be there in Jesus' name. Now, when does the believer actually get to that place that the Lord has prepared? This is very important now because you see many people do not understand what happens to the believer. When the believer leaves this world, uh, please pay attention, when a believer dies here, his soul, his spirit is separated from the body. And the soul, the spirit immediately goes to the presence of the Lord, but the body is in the grave. All through the time, that body will be in the grave, the the spirit and the soul will be with the Lord directly. We learned that from the story of Lazarus. He died. His body was buried. But then he was taken by angels into Abraham's bosom. You learned that from Stephen. When they were stoning him, he looked up and saw Jesus Christ. He said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. So, we know that when a believer dies, immediately the spirit and the soul will go to be with the Lord. But the body will be buried on the day of the Lord. On the day of resurrection, when the trumpet shall sound, the dead in Christ shall rise first. The dead body will rise. And then the spirit and the soul that had been in the presence of the Father will be joined unto the body, complete. Body, soul, and spirit now will be taken to their soul above. And then we which are alive, we have not died. Our spirit, our soul, still in us, our body still there, will be transformed. And then with that glorified, transformed body, will go to be with the Lord. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. See what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 reading from verse 1 For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle referring to our body were dissolved if we were to die and then the body were to be decomposed we have a building of God that's a new body and house not made with hands eternal in the heavens for in this we groan earnestly designing to be closed upon with our house which is from heaven if so be that being in close, we shall not be found naked. And then in verse 4, for we that are in this tabernacle in the body, we do groan, being burdened, for not, not for that we would be unclosed, but closed upon, and that mortality might be swallowed up out of life. Then in verse 8, we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. When your spirit and your soul departs from the body, you are absent from the body, you'll be immediately present with the Lord. So, immediately a believer dies now, he goes to heaven. His soul, his spirit goes to heaven. On the resurrection day, the body will then be raised up, joined with the uh, spirit and the soul to forever be in the direct presence of the Lord. If that is so, what should be our desire now? What should be our goal now? What should be our aim now? What should we be reaching for to now? What should we be praying for now? We should be desiring that by the grace of God, when that trumpet shall sound, or when the end shall come, we shall be with the Lord, and will be with the Lord in Jesus. Jesus' name. That should be our desire. That should be our aspiration. It should be our prayer from day to day. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3 from verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, that is if you have the new life. You died with Christ spiritually. You are buried with Christ spiritually. After you had been crucified with Christ spiritually, now you rise up in newness of life. If ye then, if you have been risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Where Christ uh, seated on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead and your life is seed with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life shall appear then shall ye appear with him in glory. We shall be with the Lord. In Second Peter 
chapter 3, Second Peter chapter 3, from verse 11 to verse 14. Here the word of God is telling us. Now, you understand, all these scriptures we are reading, they are telling us something, that we have something better than what we have on earth here. On earth here, everything is insecure. On earth here, it is not stable. But we have the promise of the Lord Jesus Christ in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And when I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. It's coming the second time. And then I will take you unto myself, so that where I am, there you will be also. That's why the true Christian does not regard this world as his fixed final home. In fact, that's why it's always desiring, saying, I will be in that place. And I pray that every one of us will be there in Jesus' name. In uh, this Second Peter, chapter 3, from verse 11, seeing that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of person? ought she to be in all holy conversation and godliness as we are preparing to go there. As we are getting ready to be in that prepared place, the Lord should be walking in our lives now so that it will be a prepared people for a prepared place. If the place is prepared, but the people are unprepared, the unprepared people will not match the prepared place. That's why you will allow the grace of God to walk in your life, the Spirit of God to walk in your life, the Word of God to transform your life, so that He'll prepare you to fit into that place He has gone to prepare for you. What manner of persons ought she to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Do you know that all the things that the people are amassing now, all the things they are gathering together now, all the things that will not allow them to serve God now, eventually everything will be dissolved. In, in fact, it says things in the sky, things in the in the firmament of the of the sky, and things all the all the planets and all the galaxies and everything will be melted away with fervent heat. And things on earth as well, the elements, the houses, the property, everything will be melted away with fervent heat. And then in verse 13, nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. You see, this world is defiled already. This world is polluted already because of the uh, pollution and the immorality and everything. Destruction is coming. But there is another place where there will be no pollution, there will be no defilement, and uh, the devil will not have any activity there. It's a place where righteousness dwells. And the people that have been made righteous, the people that have been cleansed, and the blood of the Lamb, they will be there. You will not be found missing that day in Jesus' name. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that we look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found in him in peace without spot and blameless. You see, it's not just every dick and Harry that will be there. It's not every church goer that will be there. It's not everyone saying, Lord, Lord, that shall be there. If you want to be there, and I know you want to be there, you'll be diligent to be found in him in peace. Be at peace with everyone without spot and blameless. That's still coming back to that verse again. Follow peace with, uh, with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. When we eventually get to heaven, it will be a wonderful place. Number one, there will be no wicked men there to persecute us. If you are going through a persecution now, it's a temporary thing, it will soon be over. Number two, there will be no devil there to tempt us. There are temptations in this world. But once we leave this world and we cross over to the great beyond, the devil will not be able to tempt us anymore. Number three, there will be undisturbed, unbroken rest. Today, maybe when you are resting, it can be disturbed and the rest can be broken. But when we get over there, it's an everlasting, eternal, undisturbed, unbroken rest. Number four, there will be perfect freedom. In this world, uh, you are not always free to do everything you want to do. But when we get over there, there will be perfect freedom. Number five, on a syllable security. Totally secured because we are told the gates of the city will not be locked. It will be opened every time. There will be nothing. 
the dragon will not be there. The beast will not be there. The antichrist will not be there. The false prophet will not be there. No sin will be there. No wicked sin will be there. Therefore, there will be security for everyone there. Number six, there will be an inconceivable delight joy, uninterrupted fellowship with the Lord, that is the time when faith will give place to sight. All the things you are believing now, you hear it, you have not seen it but you believe. And Jesus Christ said, blessed are those people that have not seen and yet have believed. But when we get over there there will be no need for faith anymore because what you are hoping for, what you are believing for, everything will be clearly seen. And at that time, grace will be swallowed up in glory. Here now we need grace. Here now we we need mercy. Here now, when we pray, we're asking, oh Lord, let your grace be sufficient unto me. When we get over there, grace will have finalized and done all its work. It will be glory over there. We shall be there in Jesus' name. But then, between now and then, what are we going to be doing? Because if you are born again now, your name is written in the book of life in heaven. If you are a child of God now, you have an inheritance waiting for you in heaven. But between the time you are born again, Again, and your name is there, but your body is here, your life is here, and your activities are here until the time you get over there eventually. What are the things you are to be doing now? Those that leads us to the next point now the sacrifice of praise to God. The sacrifice of praise to God. Look at Hebrews chapter 13 and in verse 15. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually that he is the fruit of our leaves giving thanks to his name you find one word in this verse which you should not pass by in verse 15 therefore Therefore, it's telling us because of verse 14 because if there is pain it's temporary if there's pleasure, it's temporary. And all the cities of the world, it's temporary. Everything you see now is temporary. There's something eternal. There's something everlasting. There's something that will never, that will never end. And it's prepared for you. And we're seeking that thing which is to come. And Christ has gone before us and is preparing that place for us. And he actually wants us to be there because of that. Therefore, by him, through him, because he's the one that saves you, you see everything you do now is by him. Everything you do now is through him. You pray, it's in his name. Anything you do, you do it in his name. You glorify God, you do it in his name. You do a good deed in its name. You praise the Lord, it's in his name. You do everything now by Christ. By him, therefore, let us offer let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. Here he is telling us that we need to offer praise unto the Lord. That even if you don't have any other thing, as you think about heaven, as you think about that beautiful place, as you think about the uninterrupted joy you are going to have, undisturbed rest you are going to have, the eternal inheritance you are going to have, whatever is happening here, you will look forward and you say, I praise the Lord. It's like when a woman is pregnant of a child. This woman has been praying and praying and praying, oh Lord, give me a child, oh Lord, give me a child. And now she is uh, gone for test and they said that everything is okay, the child is healthy, and they have given her, they have told her this is the time you are likely to deliver the baby, she might be having some little inconveniences, but then she thinks, this is answer to my prayer. A baby is coming on the way. Whatever I'm going through now, thank God for this baby. She will be able to endure. She will overlook all the pain because of the baby that is coming. That's what the Lord is saying here. He's saying, look at heaven. Look at the joy. Look at the rest. Look at the eternal inheritance. Look at the things the Lord has prepared for us. Whatever you are going through now, it says, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise. Why is it called the sacrifice of praise? Because it may not always be easy. We don't praise God only when we feel like. When you don't feel like, that's the sacrifice. When it appears things are upside down, and yet you need to praise the Lord, that's a sacrifice. A sacrifice of praise to God, and to God continually. Morning, afternoon, and evening, praising the Lord. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, praising the Lord. When things are alright, when things are not quite alright, praising the Lord continually. When your prayer has been answered, when there is a little delay, praising the Lord continually. Why are you praising the Lord continually when things are bad? Oh, you say, praise the Lord. It could have been worse. 
and that I'm still on earth, and that things are not worse, and it is as limited as this, the problem of God, I still need to praise the Lord. How many thousands and millions of believers? Believers like me, believers like you, have gone through problems greater than the problems we're going through. As we look at the way the Lord has moderated our problems, and the way he has limited our temptation, and the way he has controlled the things that are happening to us, so we say, praise the Lord, although it appears there's a problem here, there's a problem there, when I consider my situation, with the situation of fellow believers who are worse than myself, I must be praising the Lord. That's why it says, every time, continually praising the the Lord, then he says that is when he says praising the Lord the fruit of our leaves that means it will be coming out of your mouth it's coming out of your tongue giving thanks unto his name, in fact this is one of the reasons why we're real children of God to keep on praising the Lord, in First Peter chapter 2 First Peter chapter 2 reading from verse 5 Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood. What are we to be doing? What's the reason we are in the priesthood, in ministry, in service unto the Lord? To offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Do you, do you see here, you'll be praising the Lord. You'll be offering those spiritual sacrifices to the Lord. But understand, if they're going to be acceptable to the Lord, it is going to be through Jesus Christ. It must go through Jesus. Anything you do is through Jesus Christ. You first of all get born again. Your sins are forgiven. Your sins are washed away by the cleansing of the blood of the Lamb. And then as a result you are able to continue praising the Lord and glorifying Him and offering up spiritual sacrifices. What if you are not born again? Will the praise be acceptable to the Lord? What if you are not a child of God? What if you don't know Jesus? What if your sins are still there? What if you are only trying on your own? And you want to get saved by your self-effort. And you abandon Jesus Christ. Your praise cannot go through unto the Father. Because it must go through Jesus Christ. And it is only the praise of the people that are born again. That will go through the Lord Jesus Christ. In Proverbs chapter 15. Proverbs chapter 15. Verse 8. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination unto the Lord. The sacrifice of praise from the wicked, from the sinner, who is rejecting Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of the Father, it's an abomination to the Lord. If you want your praise to be accepted, if you want the works that you do to be accepted, if you want anything, any service in the church, any service in the town, anything that you do to be accepted of the Lord, you will come through the Lord Jesus Christ. With told in 2nd Chronicles this is a wonderful verse of scripture 2nd Chronicles chapter 29 2nd Chronicles chapter 29 and in verse 31 then Ezekiah answered and said, Now ye have consecrated yourselves unto the Lord. Come near and bring sacrifices and thank offerings into the house of the Lord. And the congregation brought in sacrifices and thank offerings, and as many as were of a free heart burnt offerings. You see the uh, king called them. He said, Now you have consecrated yourself unto the Lord. Come near. Come and worship the Lord. Come and sacrifice unto the Lord. And it's going to be a sacrifice of praise. The Lord loves it when you praise Him. The Lord loves it when you glorify Him. The Lord loves it. You start your prayer. You start with praising the Lord. You start with singing unto the Lord. Because that's the way He wants it. In Psalm 50. Psalm 50 and in verse 14. Psalm 50 verse 14, or found to God, thanksgiving. That's a commandment, or found to God, thanksgiving. Don't allow a day to pass. Thank God, praise the Lord. And then it says, pay thy vows unto the Most High. And then in verse 23, whoso offereth praise glorifieth me. If you offer praise unto the Lord, you are actually glorifying the Lord. He loves you to praise him. He loves you to glorify him. To forget everything around you. To forget everything you are going through. Some things that are inconvenient. Forget all about them. And offer praise unto the Lord. And to him that ordereth his conversation right. Will I show the salvation, the deliverance of God. In Psalm 69. Psalm 69. 
verses 30 and 31. I will praise the name of God with a song and will magnify him with thanksgiving. You will praise the name of the Lord. You praise him because of his attributes. You praise him because of his worthiness. You praise him because of his promises. You praise him because of his goodness. You praise him because of his mercy. You praise him because of everything he has done. He has done everything well. I will praise the name of God with a song. I will magnify Magnify him. I will glorify him. You magnify him. You look at those attributes. You magnify the attributes. You explain the attributes. And you glorify the name of the Lord in verse 31. This also shall please the Lord better than an ox or a bullock that has horns and hooves. That is, when you are praising the Lord, when you are glorifying the Lord, it actually honors the Lord. It pleases the Lord. And the Lord is happy concerning it. In Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 20. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Don't ever quarrel with God. Don't ever accuse God for anything. Don't ever murmur. Don't ever complain about anything. Look on the bright side of life. If you are looking at what you have not got, you will not know how to praise the Lord. Look at what you have got. If you are looking at what he has not done, you will not be able to praise the Lord. Look at what he has done. If you are looking at the privileges that you have missed, you will not be able to praise the Lord. Look at the privileges he has given you. And you will be given thanks always, every time for all things, in all situations unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you see that? You abide in Christ. You remain in Christ. And while you are in Christ, you keep on glorifying the Lord. In Colossians chapter 1 verse 12. Colossians chapter 1 verse 12. Giving thanks unto the Father which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. He has uh, given us the privilege that will be partakers with the saints, with, the, with other children of God, because of that will praise his name. In uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and in verse 18, in everything, give thanks. In everything, give thanks. There's no exception there. Every situation you find yourself, every circumstance you find yourself, every day, every time, in everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus us concerning you. Why are we glorifying God? Why are we praising the name of the Lord? Number one, because he has prepared for us the heavenly city. That's what we read in Hebrews chapter 13 verse 15. There is a therefore. Because of that, the heavenly city prepared for you and for me. We are praising God all the time. Number two, because he, all of all, he does to prepare us for that place. He's prepared the place and is preparing us because of that we need to praise him. Number three, because of the plan of salvation. Not only there is a plan of salvation, because of the experience of salvation. He planned that salvation. He called you and it's an efficacious call. How many people were called and they couldn't respond? How many people prayed and they didn't have assurance of salvation? But in your own case, he gave you assurance of salvation. He gave you confidence. You can call him Abba Father. That he opened up your heart and he made you to believe and you are rejoicing in the Lord. When the people that had the gospel, the same time you had the gospel, they are still battling with doubt. You need to praise the name of the Lord. Number four, because of his keeping power. He brought you into the kingdom and is keeping you in the kingdom. You should be praising the Lord. Number five, because of his grace and goodness. Look at his grace in your life. How many people are falling and you are still standing? How many people are not in the fold now and you are still in the fold? And look at the goodness of the Lord in your life. You must be praising the Lord number six because of the promises and the privileges as given us in prayer. As you have any problem, you look at the word of God and the spirit of God will direct you to a promise. So you must praise the Lord. He has given us promises and privileges in prayer. Number seven, because of answered prayer. See, we're just coming from a retreat and you see how he answered the prayers of people. It's not only because he answered your prayer, he answered the prayers of other people. And as they are rejoicing, you'll be rejoicing with them and saying this God is great. This God should be magnified and glorified. Number eight, because of his word, 
What will you be without his word? If you woke up in the morning, there is no Bible to read. If when you are sad, there is no word of God to comfort you. If when you have a problem, there is no word of God to guide you and to show you light and give you wisdom, what will your life have been? Because of his word, you are glorifying him and praising him. Number nine, because of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Although Jesus Christ has left, he left the comforter. I will give you the comforter. He will abide with you always. Number 10, because of his mercy and undeserved blessings. As you look at all the things we have got, you count your blessings. Name them one by one. See what the Lord has done for you. And you'll be praising the Lord. You'll be glorifying him every day, every time, always, continually. But then, it's not only that we're glorifying God, there's something else he wants us to do, which is well-pleasing unto him. That leads us to point number three, the service that pleases God. The service that pleases God. In Hebrews chapter 13, reading from verse 16, But to do good and to communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Now you see here, uh, the word of God is a balanced word. In verse uh, 15, it's telling us to look up. In verse 15, it's telling us to praise the Lord. And there's a vertical relationship. And everything, something happens to look up to say, God in heaven, my Father who is in heaven, I praise your name, I glorify your name. And whatever it is, during the day, your heart is towards the Lord. Your mind is towards the Lord. But you know, you can be so much towards the Lord like that, you forget that you're still on earth, that there should be an horizontal dimension in your Christian life. You know, there are some people that are so spiritual, God is on the throne. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Bless his name. God is taking care of me. The will of the Lord be done. Everything is spiritual. Everything is glory, glory, glory unto God. But with their wife, or their husband, or their neighbors, horizontal dimension of their relationship, there is nothing going on. And so he tells us, as you are preparing for heaven, there will be the cross. And the cross, there's a vertical line. That's your relationship with God. There is your horizontal line. That's your relationship with the body of Christ. That's your relationship with the household of faith. That's your relationship with the people who are believers in the Lord. Therefore, he says, there's something you must not forget. He says, to do good. And to communicate, that means to share, to share your life, to share your joy, and to share the burdens of other people, and to share the needs of other people, and to carry their load with them, and not to go through life, no load carrying, praise the Lord, the Lord has saved me, I am on my way to heaven, everything is so nice now, I'm so spiritual, but look at your neighbor, he's crying, cry and weep with them that are weeping, and rejoice with them that are rejoicing, let there be an horizontal dimension in your Christian Christian life to do good and to communicate, forget not. Don't be so spiritual, you forget somebody needs a helping hand from you. It says, For with such sacrifices, you sacrifice, you deny yourself of some things you yourself need, but your neighbor, your brother, your sister has need of that thing too. You sacrifice, and when you do that and you give to him and you do good, the Lord is well pleased. We're told in Galatians. Chapter 6, chapter 6, reading from verse uh, reading from verse 9. Let us not be weary in well doing. I helped a brother so and so. He didn't even say thank you. Let us not be weary in th- in a well doing. I helped a sister so and so. And any time he talks, she talks about what she has. She never mentions my name. That I was the one instrumental to what has happened to her. Don't worry about that. Let us not be weary in well doing. When I help people, instead of they helping me in return, they leave me with my own problem. Don't allow that to make you weary. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. I pray you will not faint. In verse 10, as we have therefore opportunity, be looking for opportunity in your zone, looking for opportunity in your district, looking for opportunity in the church as we come together like this. Don't just come in in isolation and go back in isolation. Touch the life of your neighbor. Touch the life of a brother. Touch the life 
life of his sister. He says, as we have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are the household of faith. Do you see the two groups there? All men, all creatures of God, but now the new creation, the people that are born again, those who are the household of faith. I pray God will help us to keep on doing good to one another in Jesus' name. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and in verse 15. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 15. Here we still have the exhortation of the word of God unto us. See that none render evil for evil unto any man. Our revenge I will retaliate. I will strike them back. They did it to me. I will do it to them. They will know I pay somebody. Don't do that. Don't do that. Now, because of heaven, and because you are going to that wonderful place, and five minutes in heaven, you will forget every pain and every problem you ever went through. Just forget everything that happened until this time. The problems of yesterday should have gone with yesterday. The problems of last week should have gone with last week. And see that none of you render evil for evil unto any man, any man. But ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves as believers in the same church, and to all men, even to the people that are outsiders. Let us be good to them. In Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, reading from verse 13 and verse 14. Romans chapter 12, verse 13, distributing to the necessity of the saints. You know the necessities, you know the needs in the lives of your brothers and sisters, but oh, I did good and they, uh, uh, they burnt my fingers the first time I did good. I'm not going to do it again, don't do that. It says distributing to the necessity of the saints, giving to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. In verse 20 and verse 21, therefore, if thine enemy hunger, what does it say? feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. You know, as we live in the houses where we're living, sometimes you'll find a co-tenant. Uh, maybe you are cooking in the same kitchen, or you are doing something in the same bathroom, whatever, and uh, they didn't take care of the things that belong to you. And the devil will bring the temptation. They should know how it pains somebody. When I needed salt, when I needed sugar, when I needed this, the other time, they acted as if they didn't have. They even told a lie, and told their daughter to tell me they don't have. Now it has come to their turn. I have and they don't have. I will show them. Don't show them anything that's the character of the devil. Show them the love of God. Show them that you are born again. Show them that you are a child of God. Show them that you will not retaliate. In verse 20 therefore if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire to melt his heart to submission and repentance on his head. Be not overcome of evil. When you retaliate, it means you overcome of evil. When you revenge, it means you overcome of evil. But be not overcome of evil. Overcome evil with good. We will do it like that in Jesus' name. And when you do it, the Lord will not forget your labor of love. The Lord will not forget the good things you do. And the Lord will definitely and surely reward you. In Hebrews chapter 6, Hebrews chapter 6 from verse 9. Hebrews chapter 6 from verse 9. But, beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though with us speak. You see, these things we are talking about, they are the things that mark us out as children of God. They are the things that accompany salvation. They are the things that reveal we have met the Lord. He has changed us. He has made us to be good. And if He has made us to be good, then He will make us to do good. It's one thing to be good. He has changed your nature. He has touched your life. He has made you a new creature. It's another thing to do good, to allow that new nature to flow out, to help other people. That's why it says, let us see the things that accompany, that follow salvation. In verse 10, for God is not unrighteous to forget your work and your labor of love, which ye have showed towards his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. That means that 
you are ministering to the saints, you are helping the children of God, you clothe the naked, you feed the hungry, you help those who are defeated in life, you lift up those who are falling. If you have some financial means, and some people are so poor, they are living from hand to mouth, you are able to stretch forth the hand of mercy, and you are able to supply their need through the help of God. In verse 11, and we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. Today we have been talking about heaven, and the Lord will soon come back. And you know that without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. But what, let's say you are holy. Let's say you are pure. But then, you are not doing the things we have learned today. You are not helping people. You are not contributing to the life of anyone. What reward are you going to have on the final day? You need to do something so that by the grace of God, when the Lord will come, you will be rewarded in Jesus' name. In Matthew chapter 25, Matthew chapter 25, verse 34, Then shall the king say unto them on the right hand, I pray you will be on the right hand on that day. You will not be on the left. You will not be among the rejected. You will not be among the people that will be told to go away to everlasting punishment. You will be on the right hand. And the Lord will tell you, Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom that is prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, hungered, and ye gave me meat. Are you feeling the hungry? I was thirsty, and ye give me drink. Are you giving water? Ordinary water to those who are thirsty. I was a stranger, and you and ye took me in, naked, and you closed me. Are you helping those who are naked? Those who are destitute, and they have nothing to take care of themselves. I was sick, and ye visited me. When the people, the children of God, when they get sick in the community, in the district, do you visit them at all? Do, are you concerned about them at all? I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Are you uh, interested in the people that are restricted one way or the other it may be in, in the real prison or something has confined them then shall the righteous answer him saying Lord, when saw we thee, and hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink, when saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee, or when saw we thee sick, and in prison, and came unto thee, then the, and the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of these, uh, least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. I pray that the Lord will help us. To make all these sacrifices and to show that we are really born again. To show that we are really children of God. And the grace of God will appear in our lives and make us to do good unto other people in Jesus' name. And we don't know when it will be, it may not be long. The trumpet shall sound. And we which are alive will be caught up together with those who have died, will be resurrected. I pray that you will be there on that final wonderful day. You must uh, take the things of the world with a loose hand and fix your mind and fix your heart and fix your attention in heaven. So when the trumpet shall sound, you and I, we shall be there in Jesus' name. We'll rise up and talk to the Lord. I don't want to be found missing on that day. And I don't want you to be missing on that final day. Take the things of the world with a loose hand. Don't hold it with both hands. Don't put all your heart, all your attention, all your mind on the things of this world. Be looking up. Be looking up for the coming of the Lord. we we'll seek a better country. we we'll seek that other place which is to come. The Lord has gone to prepare a place for us and we want to be there on that final day tell the lord if you have been born again praise the lord and tell the lord keep me until that final day keep me until that final day help me i will not backslide help me i will not look back it will not be long it will not be long the things of this world are temporary transitory it will not be long. The pain in the world is not permanent. The pleasure in the world is not permanent. The riches in the world is not permanent. All the things you can see, they are not permanent. What is permanent is heaven. What is permanent is, a, is inheritance reserved for us in heaven. What is permanent is the glory of God awaiting us in heaven. Don't allow the transitory, temporary things of this world to hinder the permanent thing the Lord is preparing for you. Let's be wise. Let's be wise. Don't allow the sin of today to hinder your future. Arise, see, and depart from hence, for your rest is not here. We're looking for that glorious city. We're looking for that glorious city. He wants you to be there. Your place is there. Your place is there. Your mansion is there. 
Your reward is there. Your inheritance is there. Your blessing is there. Your rewards, everything he has provided for you, they are there. Endure till the end. Keep on serving the Lord. Don't look back. Don't look back. Don't complain. Don't murmur. Be praising the Lord continually. Be praising the Lord always. Be praising the Lord in all things at all times. That's the will of God for us. That we'll be praising the Lord. It's the will of God for us in Christ Jesus. Praise Him for His salvation. Praise Him for the word He has given us. Praise Him for the church in which we worship. Praise Him for the privilege we have. Praise Him for the promises He has given us. Praise Him that things are not worse. If you think you have a problem, praise Him that the problems are limited. Praise Him for the answer to prayer. Praise Him for His grace and goodness. Praise Him for the ministry of the Holy Spirit in your life. Praise Him because of that wonderful eternal place He has gone to pray, prepare for you. Praise the Lord. And don't forget to do good. Don't forget to do good. Don't forget to help people, assist people, intercede for people, pray for people, give what you have to supply the needs of other people. Be good and do good. And the Lord will reward you on a final day.